In today's episode of Random Political Candidates, I just feel like talking about... We've got the teenage geriatric obstruction turtle, Bitch McConnell. Addison Mitchell McConnell III was born February 20th, 1942. The day after the 3rd Bomber Command was created, who a couple months later would fly another Mitchell into the history books, the B-25 Mitchell during the Doolittle Raid. And the main purpose of the Mitchell Bomber and the Doolittle Raid was to boost American morale. And I feel like American morale's been pretty low lately, so, so all I'm saying is, you know... Maybe we could boost it by yeeting Mitch McConnell off the deck of an aircraft carrier. Worked in the 40s, was born in Sheffield, Alabama, big fucking surprise, and his family operated a funeral home, which was probably where he had the opportunity to personally meet death and broker a deal for his soul. 1944, he contracted polio, which paralyzed his upper left leg, and he had to go through extensive rehabilitation treatment, which unfortunately saved him from being disabled for the rest of his life. Speaking about his rehabilitation treatment later in life, he noted that it almost bankrupt his family, which is something he spent an entire career fighting to try to make sure that all poor and middle class people can experience. You know, families going bankrupt for medical cares, good character building and all. In 1956, he moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and in 1964, he graduated from the University of Louisville with a bachelor's in political science. Also interned for Senator John Sherman Cooper, and while doing this, he attended the March on Washington and watched MLK give his I Have a Dream speech and a number of other civil rights rallies. He would go on to know that it was at this point in his life that would eventually inspire him to run for Senate, I'm assuming because he got sick of seeing all the uppity brown people expecting equal rights. In 1967, his educational draft deferment was about to expire because, you know, of course he had a draft deferment. So he went out and preemptively joined the Army Reserves because they had the lowest chance of seeing combat. But he managed to weasel his way out of that with a medical discharge a month later. However, just because he was too much of a little bitch to go fight in rich old people's stupid wars would not stop him from growing up to become a rich old person who would send your kids to fight and die in stupid wars. He graduated from the University of Kentucky College of Law in 1967 and passed the bar exam right Right away because you know you can't sell your soul without getting a law degree. After graduating college, he went immediately into politics in the late 60s and early 70s, working as assistants for senators and governor campaigns. Because the hypocrisy of spending your entire life fighting socialism uh, tastes a little bit better in your mouth when every single paycheck you've ever received in your whole fucking life has come from the U.S. taxpayer. In 74, he got a job as assistant deputy attorney general under Gerald Ford. And in 77, he was elected as Jefferson County judge, where he would stay in that position until 1984. In 1985, he was elected senator to Kentucky, and it's a job he's held till today. If McConnell Angelo had been a senator any fucking longer, he'd have been at the christening ceremony for the USS Constitution. Early on, he would have been considered a practical, pragmatic, moderate, bipartisan Republican. He supported things like abortion rights and unions. I'm pretty sure this was a trick to bait people into being like, hey, that Mitch, he's not a bad guy. He seems like pretty decent, you know? Because Mitch McConnell is a lot of things, but dumb is not one of them. And I believe at no point he's changed as a person. So he spent about a decade really getting his claws in his Senate seat, getting connections, gaining power. And in 1997, he was made chairman of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, where he's finally able to start latching onto power like a snapping turtle on a small child's arm whose parents would go bankrupt paying for the medical bills. Because it is that committee that is responsible for getting Republicans elected. And Mitch was good at that for all the wrong reasons. It was during this time that he really started to turn into the monster we all know and hate today. In 99, he was one of 50 senators to vote to impeach and remove Clinton, probably Probably because he was mad he's never gotten a blowjob he didn't have to pay for. In 2003, he became Senate Majority Whip because forcing people to do things they don't want to do is his favorite pastime. In 2006, he became Senate Minority Leader, and by 2014, he became Senate Majority Leader. By 2018, he became the longest Republican Party leader, and arguably the man who's wielded more power in Washington than any single person in history. How he's done this is by way of obstruction. He has openly and freely admitted that the best way to get Republicans elected is by blocking any Thing that the opposite parties want to do, even if he agrees with it, and even if it's better for the people and the country. When Obama was elected, he said that the single most important thing the Republicans could do was make him a one-term president, and he did everything he could do to achieve that, even if it meant burning down the entire fucking country in the process. He cultivated an amazing ability to strong-arm his party into opposing things that they even agree with, or that's bipartisan, to keep the other party from getting any victories. He's also great at strong-arming his party into ramming shit through when they do have enough power to get it done to make up for all that lost time. And this is exactly what he did. He fought tooth and nail to block things like Obamacare, even though it was immensely popular, to fight things like Medicare expansion, even though things like that would have really helped his family when he had the polio and shit. He obstructed much needing banking reform, even though it was incredibly popular with everybody since they just 
fucked us all over in 09. The only policy that he had was making sure that no policies would get passed while a Democrat was president. And whatever superpower the devil gave him when he sold his soul as a child has given him the ability to force almost all Republicans in his party to walk the line, to toe the line no matter what. His cold calculating tactics to ensure that democracy will never function properly doesn't stop at strong arming Republicans to be even worse legislators than they already are. He literally wrote the book on using the filibuster to create gridlock and kill democracy. He has used the filibuster so much to create gridlock, he will filibuster his own party's fucking policies. In fact, since the debt ceiling's a hot topic right now, in 2012, he proposed a measure to let Obama raise the debt ceiling. He did this hoping that Democrats wouldn't agree to it and it would cause division within their party. When that backfired and Democrats agreed to his proposal, he filibustered his own fucking proposal. It does seem appropriate though that a turtle has dedicated his entire career to making the government and move as slowly as possible. And the use of the filibuster in this way has been one of the most damaging things to our democracy because the filibuster allows senators to be total douchebags with almost no accountability. If you can talk a bill to death through a filibuster, uh, it doesn't get voted on. If it doesn't get voted on, you can't be held accountable for voting no against it. And with the exception of a few high profile bills, Tons of bills that get killed by filibuster and you never hear about it. When you do hear about it, you rarely hear about who filibustered it to death and why, which means that they can kill bills and not be held responsible for not doing their fucking job. And he knows this because there's been times the filibuster has been used against him. Remember that time he refused to call a vote on Merrick Garland for the Supreme Court because he's not only hell bent on ruining America and democracy through the legislative branch, but also through the judiciary. It was some serious unprecedented bullshit. So then when Trump tried filling Merrick Garland's stolen Supreme Court seat with Neil Gorsuch, Democrats were filibustering it. And the filibuster wasn't so cool because it was being used against him. So, you know, he just got rid of it for Supreme Court justices, which ended up being very convenient for him. It was like, remember when Obama appointed Garland like eight months before an election and old Mitch the bitch was like, we got, we got to wait till the election so the people can pick the president they want to nominate the next, uh, next Supreme Court justice. And then the president that the people did not pick by three million votes got to give the asshole he wanted Merrick Garland's seat. Fast forward a few years, it's now two months before the election and Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies, and suddenly old Mitchie Mitch's tune changed from letting the people decide to ramming through the Handmaid Tale's Amy Karen Barrett a month before the November presidential election. I said it before and I'll say it again, if the Republicans didn't have double standards, they would have no standards at all. Now I've said multiple times that the GOP has created Frankenstein's monster by building a party off of outrage to get more votes. And it's hard to argue that anybody has sewn more stitches into that big green monster than Mitch McConnell. For a long time, Mitch McConnell pulled the strings on the monster and he wielded that power any chance he got. And here's the thing is Mitch is not an outright outrage politician. He's happy to set up the circumstances for outrage and let other people do the feeding off of it. Because Mitch doesn't outright say inflammatory stuff and he seems pragmatic from time to time and has found a way to avoid accountability for 90% of the bullshit he pulls in the Senate, all while pulling the strings on what was the inanimate Frankenstein's monster to wield his power, he really became the bridge that made the Ku Klux Klan palatable to the moderate right. In my opinion, he is ultimately responsible for giving them their following and their platform. And then the monster became self-aware and he lost control of it. Once the monster was self-aware, like Jerry Reed and Waterboy, they stole Coach Klein's playbook. So let's be honest, they're way too fucking stupid to come up with anything to be successful on their own, but fortunately Coach Mitch had written down some really effective plays that they now get to use whenever they feel like. And they do, with all the restraint and control of a cop in a dog park. So once Trump was elected, it's been a constant power struggle for Mitch to try to regain control of his party. And though Mitch has publicly criticized Trump for all sorts of things, including, you know, holding him responsible for trying to overthrow democracy, don't let it fool you. It's not because he's growing a spine. He is still playing the chess game to try to claw back his own power, which is why he still didn't vote to impeach Trump and at first refused to acknowledge Biden's election results until a few days later. Now, since Biden's taken office, he's actually probably been the most bipartisan we've seen him in a very long time. Even going as far as convincing about a dozen Republicans to vote with Democrats to raise the debt ceiling in 2021. But make no mistake, this has nothing to do with him getting reformed in his old, old, so, so very old age. And everything to do with a deliberate, measured plan to cut out the cancer that he gave his party for years and years of chain smoking and attempt to scrape back the immense power his own hubris has lost him. So he's a man who has spent eternity as a lawmaker. And yet somehow through all of that, the only thing of value Mitch McConnell will ever pass is away.